Bye. All right, right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Whatever part of the world the world you are in, welcome to Geopolitics in Conflict Live. Live. So we are so excited to be here. Uh, and so funny, guys. Friday went by so fast, right? I know. It was just last week. I mean, it was just, it seems like yesterday, actually. Exactly, Life exactly. Life has been full of things. Exactly. So, well, we are so excited to be here. We and have... as always, we want to thank you for viewing. Of course. And we want to thank you for subscribing. And as our joke continues, we are inching closer and closer to 70 million subscribers. Well, it's moving along. It's moving along. And, and as we said last time, we were joking about it, but not anymore. Because now we start to see, uh, it's not see, now we are moving it into a different level, shall we say. You yes. Know, in where, and that is exemplified by the guests we bring in. So speaking of guests, we hope that you like the guests we invited. I know some of you didn't like some, but here is the thing. And I wanted to let you know where we as a team stand for. And, and, and you know me by now. I'm a straightforward. <laughs> I don't sugarcoat it. Yes. It's because we have to present two sides of the argument. Some of you might not like some of our guests, but guess what? We're going to bring them those with different opinions or different whatever that is, because that's what we stand for. And we want you to have multiple views of situations because you bring your personal experience, your personal beliefs, and your thinking power to the party. And we want to present enough quality information for you to make up your own mind. Remember, our motto is stay informed, as always. And this, is the, and this is our dedication to you. The best information we have available and the best people to present multiple points of view. Exactly. And we take also this opportunity to thank our uh, Patreon members and to those who've already become a member uh, uh, in our membership uh, through the geopoliticsinconflict.com. Uh, so Elizabeth is working on some uh, stuff for us that we're going to be sharing with our members. So uh, you might want to check that membership, see what we have to offer there, because the conversation we have on that aspect there, uh, you all know about censorship, so we can be talking openly, shall we say. <laughs> we do that in our membership. So, and as always, please follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, and follow us on TikTok. So, well... What do you think? Shall we get into the Let's topics Let's start of the day? because we want to have the conversation we always enjoy with our viewers. President Biden recently said in a conversation with China that recognizes one China policy. And this morning, mm -hmm. he pronounced that Biden will has is changing his policy regarding Taiwan. Taiwan. Well, what he's referring to here is that uh, basically <laughs> what President Biden said that We'll, we will defend Taiwan. And that is a shift from the original policy of the United States that the United States will only support Taiwan in providing weapons, but they will not get involved should they do that. Now, to me personally, as an analyst, this is bad news because it's sending the wrong message to Taiwan is, to, to Taiwan leadership, whatever. China is not going to tolerate that. And we can all see where things are going. So with a statement like this from the White House, it doesn't bode well with the reality. Oh, boy. You know, Colin Powell recently died, former Secretary of State. That's correct. He died on Monday. So we all remember Colin Powell, the four-star general, the first African-American uh, uh, Secretary of State. But for Colin Powell, we'll always be remembered by his speech at the UN in which he lied to the rest of the world about the weapon of mass destruction in Iraq. But here is the thing, and I am not defending Colin Powell here. What I'm defending is the decency of how he was manipulated. He was provided with a faulty intelligence. Basically, they tricked him politically on the global stage to say something that wasn't true. And he knew it. That's why he resigned the year after. And he even said, this is going to be mentioned on my obituary when I die. And that's exactly what happened. Wow. So. Washington, Seoul, and Tokyo have condemned North Korea's ballistic missile launch. But you know, there's a little bit of a background story here. Yeah. The background story is that during the Korean conflict, the U.S. Had dumped more uh, uh, bombs and so on on North Korea than they did all in all of World War II. They leveled the country. Wow. And it, so the context is we're scared. Scared, yeah. And so they launched this ballistic missile. 
Well, yeah, yeah, indeed. This missile came was launched from the vicinity of the city of Simpo. Simpo, where North Korea maintains submarine and equipments. What they do not know, what South Korea does not know, is whether the missile was launched from a submarine or it was launched from a pod and the water somewhere. So they couldn't tell right now. So that's what's interesting about it. What's Russia, next? Russia, Pakistan, and Chinese consultation are consulting to unify the situation regarding Afghanistan. This is not really much of a surprise, actually. Well, it's not. The only surprise on it, you know what's the surprise? Is the meeting that took after the meeting in Suchi that it's going to be in Moscow, the United States was not invited. <laughs> there are 10 countries that have been invited, including Iran, India, the Republic of Asia, uh, 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 Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and Greekistan, all of them in Moscow without the U.S. presence. Well, how can you be when you just <laughs> lost the war and left? So <laughs> so that's that's an interesting meeting. Just what's going to be going Russia on. Russia has closed its NATO missions as relations with Western military bloc plunged to a new low. Indeed, Ross, I found that very interesting given the timing of the uh, the China and Russia military drill with the naval assets that uh, ships rather that crossed. And I remember Elizabeth and I, we talked about this one here. Mm -hmm. But what I found interesting is just only three days, two days later, the uh, Russia shut down the uh, or expelled NATO, uh, the three representatives in Moscow in return for what NATO did by expelling eight officers uh, from uh, uh, Brussels, kicked them out of uh, this highlights now the tensions that is already increasing because NATO now has to justify its presence. So they need to find something to create an issue. With. And, you know, one of the things we've been we've been doing is discussing the usefulness of NATO or the uselessness of NATO. I think it's uselessness. There is no need for NATO anymore. It's, it's worthless. The world is greater than five. Lazarov supports. Lavrov. Lavrov supports. Yeah. Er Erdogan? Uh, Erdogan. Erdogan of, Pakistan, of uh, Turkey. Okay. Yeah. And they need to represent the new forces in the security council. Yeah, that's I found that very, very interesting. I do follow up on what's going on with the UN Security Council. And the reason why? Because you only have five permanent members. Mm -hmm. Well, basically what Erdogan was saying during his meeting in Suchi with the Russia, that maybe it is time to change the dynamics at the UN Security Council. And rightly so. Because there were only 50 countries when the UN was established in right. 1949. You know, there are a few more now. Yeah, there are more. <laughs> even even with the increase of countries to about 70, the members of the UN Security Council moved from 12 <laughs> to 15. There are now about 193 countries represented in the UN. So, second thing, how can you uh, say that only five countries in the world de de decide what's going on for the rest of the world? Maybe it's time to. I would suggest having that on a rotational basis. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Why not? Because who are you to be sitting there permanently and decide So I found the statement very interesting. Well, not to, to anyone's surprise, there's a global energy crisis. What are the causes? What are the repercussions? And what about the situation in the Arab region? Yeah. Indeed. Well, we're going to tackle this one as part of our conversation today about the, con the shipping containers. Energy, yeah. Because energy is tied to that. What is very interesting about all this is that the idea of, of uh, energy prices are going up. And we in the United States are feeling that very much. I mean, here in the state of Texas, you have a gas that is past uh, $3 a gallon. We've never seen those prices before. But that is an indication of what lies ahead. And we're going to be discussing this more in detail. Here's a really interesting one, because Israel is known for its cybersecurity. And how do they provide penetration technology to countries and fail to prevent cyber attacks on their own institutions. I know. I was shocked to learn that nine of government hospitals were attacked. Nine institutions there in, in Israel. And knowing Israel with the, uh, the, uh, the Pegasus software, they've been given to some other countries to spy on them. <laughs> now there's a hacking team. They don't know who this hacking team is hacked into israel they couldn't defend them they were unable israelis were unable to defend against that so just it tells you if you think you're smart there is always someone smarter so 
you know, I'd like the next topic. I'd like to do it without sarcasm, but boy, I'm having a hard time. <laughs> we'll go for it, Ross. That's what it's for. Without any soldier being tried, British investigators into the war crimes in Iraq have ended with nobody being tried. I know. All That's the soldiers what... were absolutely innocent of anything irregular. Yeah. What would you expect from the UK? The defense minister, Ben Wallace, was saying, oh, we conducted investigations about the claims and nobody was found guilty. You know, the same thing we heard about Australia, the same thing we heard about Canada, the same thing we heard about the United States. <laughs> there were soldiers who committed some crime, shall we say, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And nothing has happened. And this is where you start to see, okay, is the system set up just to favor one over another? Oh, I wonder. Oh, I wonder about that. So anyway, let's move on to what we're going to be talking about today with our viewers. Well, more than 100 cargo ships are waiting in Los Angeles and Long Beach to be unloaded. That's more than $22 billion worth of products. What do you think? You think we might not have Christmas this year? Yeah, it's 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 very. There's a lot of a lot of questions coming out. And just before we forget to mention to our viewers, uh, as always, when we get to the section when we're going to have questions, please make sure to write questions so we know know this what it is. Yeah. Well, it is indeed. It's been. I mean, you've seen or you've heard or we witnessed with our own eyes when you go to the uh, to the Walmart, Target. Uh, Home Depot, there are certain shelves that you notice certain items are not on the shelves. You know, grocery stores. You know, in my lifetime, this is shocking. I've never seen this before, except for toilet paper. But that was a whole other situation. Yeah, but as a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up, Ross, because we all remember <laughs> what happened when the pandemic started here yeah. and, and how everybody was hoarding the toilet paper. Well, guess what? It looks like we might be moving into that direction now with more items. And where is it going to lead to? But the question has always been, why the clock? Why all of a sudden the backlog in the in LA uh, uh, and uh, Long Beach ports? You got over hundred ships, as you mentioned, docked waiting, but nothing happens, you know. And yet we got the state of Florida. Governor DeSantis just announced they are they've taken positive action to to modernize the ports, to put training programs for, for drivers and so on and make it worth their while to do it. But we'll dive deeper into that a little later. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead so here's really the question. Yeah. What on earth is going down? Are we having a major meltdown in the supply chain and distribution of products, Yeah. especially imported products? And the other question is, is this only pertaining to the United States or a global? And that gives you an idea about how global the economy is. If you get one weak link in the chain, it breaks down everything. And this is exactly what we are witnessing. Witnessing here, right here in the US. Right. But it's also elsewhere in Europe, in Asia, in China, in Latin America, you name it. You know, among other things, all so many of these containers are tied up and so they can't be reused. So there's not like an infinite number of these things. And so the whole world is hit by this. Yeah, indeed. Well, as you noticed here on the map, on the screen, when you notice, how many are just clogged over there? But the idea of even the ship, the the containers rather, you know, China is waiting on those containers to go back to, uh, you know, load to reuse the, the, them. Exactly, it, it, it's not happening. So even in China, where by the way we're gonna be doing a deep dive on Chinese economy because it's going some directions nobody expected, especially what I just found out this morning that the disclosure of. Uh, uh, their uh, their economic output was only four percent. That's how much it rose. That's it. Well, usually we get used to double digit. When oh yeah, with China. That's an indication for what lies ahead. And we're gonna we're gonna delve deeper in a separate video. We're gonna do a recording on it because it is tied to Evergrande. That's gonna be coming now a far bigger problem for China than they anticipated. Or did China didn't want to disclose that information? I and mean, we're going to disclose that because we are all about the truth. So, but you that's know, separate conversation. You know, when you consider what the mainstream media is, media is saying about this, they're trivializing it, saying you might not get your favorite toy or video game for Christmas. Yeah. That is not what's really going on here. I mean, that's the tip of an iceberg that says your prices are going up. Exactly. Well, they are expecting now by the end of this year, the inflation is going to reach 4%. This, the Federal Reserve was saying, oh, it's only going to be 2%. It doubled, which means what? 
Now with this inflation, people won't have enough money. We're talking about people here in the US. Right. Families would not have enough money to spend it on something else. Why? Because energy cost is going to go up. Then it has. Yeah. Food, uh, food cost is going to go up. Uh, rent, mortgages, and all that stuff. Because it's all tied. And that's what makes our global economy that global per se. That, as I said earlier, if one link is weak, it's going to destroy the rest. I've seen items at my favorite grocery store going up 20% this year. That's not 4%. Yeah. Not even close. And it's not just one product. Yeah, it's a. I was talking to a to one of the representatives, a wholesaler to the stores, uh -huh. and they said in the first uh, half of 2021, their the prices that they're charging the stores are up eight percent. That's that was in that was in July for the first half of 2021. Oh my God! Yeah, it is going up, and this is where uh, uh, my argument has always been: Okay, is the is Washington not a, not aware of this, or, or is Washington playing in a game? For a game with the lives of people, of American citizens. And that becomes the question that we always asked, and we talked about it one time. Yeah. Is this manufacturer crisis or is it real? And if it is real, who's behind it and why? Oh, boy, is this an important question? Yeah, it's because this is the thing that we want you to understand, think about, consider, because... It's going to impact you. It's going to impact your family. It's going to impact your pocket. It's going to impact your finances. And you need to know as to where things are headed. You know, you hear last time in the White House saying, well, Americans don't have to have uh, 15 colors of jackets. If they want, they can buy one jacket. Who are you to dictate to Americans what to buy and not to buy? Here's one of the consequences of this. What we're seeing, who's going to be hit most by this? Well, it's people that have you know, 50 percent of the lower income group. Yeah, but that's not all. Now we're talking about the entire middle class is going to see a rapid decline in the quality of their lifestyle and everybody lower than that. Exactly. And when you take into this with the context of the pandemic and what's going on, and the lockdown, and all that stuff, so you can just see where the issues are literally intertwined and per se, uh, what are we hitting? What we're gonna how the end of this year is gonna be economically speaking, let alone that the economy itself, even though the government has been pumping uh, printing money, oh yeah, we're printing that kind of money, you know, there is a there's a consequence, there are consequences to that kind of policy. You can't just be printing money right and left and assume right. your economy is gonna be fine. No, it won't, because that money has to be paid back. <laughs> like any other debt. And it seems that there's no there's no will from our Congress to do that. You know, one of the operative questions here is what what's really behind this problem? What is the problem and what's behind it? Well, we know that there aren't enough people working the docks to unload the, the containers. Yeah. We also know there aren't enough truckers to distribute the products and get the products out. And so we see what led to that. Exactly, Russ. And that is the question that you don't hear politicians talking about. Let's take, for example, the uh, what you mentioned about truckers. You know? Right. If we all, if Americans understand that the trucking industry has been dereg dere deregulated back in the eighties under Jimmy Carter's uh, administrations, you know the salary has been decreased completely. So if you are a truck driver, saying to yourself, "Why will I want to be sitting on a truck driving from the east to the west coast of the United States?" for $35,000 or 40,000, whatever that might be. I actually interviewed three truckers and two of them had their own separate rigs. Mm -hmm. And what they said is that even with their own rigs that we maintain our own truck, we just put the trailer on and haul it. Every year it gets tougher and tougher to make money thanks to federal regulation, which supposedly mm. doesn't exist. And thanks to the lower prices that, that they are paid to deliver these things. And all of them said, we're getting out of the business. Yeah, because there's no benefit, there's no profit in it. What's the point? Well, 92% turnover annually and a very high cost to get in because you've got to be trained for a number of months. Matter of fact, the federal government has stopped making loans for this mm -hmm. because people don't stay in the business long enough to pay back the loans. So is it any wonder that we've got a shortage of truckers? It's no wonder at all. Exactly. And now what you add to that, Russ, what you just said, add the cost of energy oh, yeah. and add the crumble infrastructure. You know, when you have crumbling bridges and highways where the structure is going to have to go on and the, the road is not well maintained, 
Why? Because we are going spending money on weapons rather than building bridges. Rather than building a highway, rather than having a, a, a solid infrastructure, because exactly. yeah, because infrastructure, without a good infrastructure, your economy will not prosper. That is a bottom line. That's a principle, if you will, when it comes down to economics. You know, the infrastructure of the United States right after World War II, it skyrocketed in terms of quality and the quantity. And the thinking at that time was, this will help us with national defense. And what it really helped us do is develop a truly robust economy. Now, where did that go? Where did that national resolve go? Well, it went into billion dollar tanks mm. and other waste. I don't mean to say that other projects, other projects. Yeah, right. <clears throat> well, that because that money was wasted on some other stuff that have nothing to do with the welfare of the citizens or the benefit or the betterment of society. Exactly. You know, we say it the way it is, you know, because that's that's <clears throat> how government thinks in those terms of where can we spend our the tax money well it's not their money to begin it's your money so especially for those who are here in the us it's your money that's been wasted you know you know i'm livid about it because i have no problem paying taxes i'll pay taxes but as long as the taxes benefits the country right you know everybody not just it but when money is just wasted i got an issue with that you know what would you want a, an average joe average jane working 40 50 hours a week and the government comes over and take 30% of his or her salary to be given to uh, weapon manufacturers, to be given to some programs that have nothing to do with the betterment of that individual, his family, his community, his town, his state. I mean, till when? This stuff has to stop at some point. You know, to put, to put this into a perspective, compared to 1980, when... Teamsters actually ran the trucking industry and people could live on the money that exactly. they made. Exactly. And what we saw then is there were more than 2 million truckers in the Teamster Union. You know what the number is now? What? 7,500. 75,000. 75,000. Wow. Went from 2 million to 75,000. Wow, 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 is wow, it wow. any wonder yeah. that no one's representing the truckers themselves and they have been squeezed to the point that 92% turnover? I mean, we surfaced that number before, but it's outrageous. Exactly. So, well, just to tie all this to energy, because that is a key element that we need to understand the link. Because, again, when we talk about the, the cargo ships or, or the uh, ship containers are being uh, just docked in, in water somewhere, anchoring in water, there is also the cost of the energy aspects of it. Okay. And why is that important? Because we all know, and especially, I'm sure you noticed, whatever part of the world you're in, the cost of energy is going up. And now you're seeing an increase in a natural gas, you know, because most of the consumption is coming from e in Asia, with China, of course, taking the lead and some right. other countries there because the consumption of it. And, uh, and that in itself is going to impact the whole world economy. And why is that? Because before the pandemic, when the prices were down, it was enough storage now when the lockdown happened after the pandemic start you start to see countries did not replenish their reserves and now you take a country like russia you know saying sure we'd be happy to supply you with natural gas if you have a long-term contract with us we don't want to do contracts for two months right well it's <clears throat> their products they can decide whatever they want so you mean russia might actually be looking out for its own best interest <laughs> Oh, say it isn't true. Be, it's not true. Why should we be surprised at that, right? You know, because that is where the problem in Europe now they're blaming. As a matter of fact, Europe is blaming China. <laughs> well, China consumption is high. Yeah, because it's a big market. But China is also finding out with the issues they have internally, economically speaking, right. one of them has to do with energy. They are finding out now, maybe it is time for us to reconsider the policies. As a matter of fact, even here in the United States, and I know I'm going back and forth between uh, China, Europe, Russia, the United States. The reason I'm doing this is to highlight to you how global things are linked. That's why we call the globalized market. That's why we call the globalized economy. Here in the United States, you've heard about uh, uh, this zero emission by 2050. And right. by the way, did you see that uh, it was on Twitter, a picture of the UN? using uh your diesel diesel <laughs> <laughs> yeah to, to power up their 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 uh exactly yeah. and, they, and they're <laughs> talking <laughs> about energy you know you know which is to me it's a double standard 
you are telling the world, the rest of the world, do this and do this and do that. Why are you not doing it? You know, how can you lead if you are not a model, if you are not an example for it? So, but that's that's a funny story for something for some <laughs> other time. I found it hilarious. But here's the question about that one. Uh, because the idea of the energy aspects of it, you know, they are saying now, uh, well, we have to reach zero emission, whatever. It ain't gonna happen. Why? Because here in the United States today, I just found out that the production of coal is increasing. <laughs> increasing and gonna stop so it becomes the idea so oh yeah here's elizabeth put this for us thank you elizabeth i mean look at the it was the un saying uh, it was it made uh it was it was it was i looked at twitter about this one it was funny funny you the you know you are saying one thing and doing another so Hold on. i need to get it i need to get it up give me one second Sure. We're waiting for Elizabeth. We're waiting for Elizabeth to upload. He's going to upload the picture for you guys. So electrical power for the uh, Teslas. Exactly. Yeah. I love it. And the same thing in India. You know, I heard the conversation yesterday with one of the scientists in the uh, in the environment and so forth. And he he was representing the government. He wasn't allowed to disclose certain information. Yeah. I, I can understand because the government told him not to disclose that. And when he was asked, oh, I see. Yeah, when he, that's the Doberman dog here, so you guys won't see it. Uh, when uh, when he was asked about will will India cut down the uh, the uh, coal, he said, "I don't think so, because it depends on coal." And you see also the consumption in China, you know, right. just because the tension with Australia, you know, all China needed to do was divert the import to Indonesia. That's where the importing coal from. I mean, Australia has massive. Uh, fields of coal and right. all that, but just to highlight to you the importance of energy into this, and and, we, and here is the shocking, if I may, please. if I may, the White House made three calls to OPEC. OPEC is the uh, is the uh, 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 oil producing exporting countries. It's the cartel, the oil cartel. In case you did not know, that controls oil global prices. The White House, the United States, made three calls to OPEC, asking them to lower the prices and increase production they didn't even respond to america <laughs> which is to to me if i am to interpret this that's a slap in the face it's, opec it, is not even responding to the u.s it's telling a very important story about the united states status in the world today and that's exactly when, when i did that when we did that live me and elizabeth we talked about the first word we mentioned you know what it was is the world moving into a multipolar system gone the days of unipolar that was controlled dictated and managed by the united states i don't think so is there anymore we are witnessing as we speak the shift into a multipolar system in which i mean well you know as i argued in in my last book about russia that was a couple of years ago i said give it a time and you're gonna see china and russia coordinating militarily and, and, I, we, and we now see yeah, it. It's I here it, today. I wrote it down, Ross, and I said, when you see that, that's your indication that the world has shifted to a multipolar system. And we keep seeing the United States government making poor policy decisions. I mean, AUKUS, for example, and trying to contain China. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how about how about the second quad? Oh, there is a second quad in the making. You know who's in it? The U.S., India, United Arab Emirates, and Israel. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're gonna we're gonna delve deeper into that. Another, uh, you know, what for? What for? But again, because those are an indication. Once you are sort of, you, you know, being involved in geopolitics, international uh, affairs, relations, global affairs, and so forth, you will learn to look for one thing as an analyst: the trends. Yeah, and the trends is your indication for how the shifting on the global landscape is taking place. You know. Now, this emergence of the so-called Quad 2 uh, with the different countries, uh, except India is the same as Quad 1, which mm -hmm. none of them is going to work anyway. But those are nothing but uh, signals for the shifting of the, of the, of the uh, global landscape. The danger that I see in that, Ross, yeah. and, and I just wanted to share it with you, because I use history as my guide to understand this. World War One, 
Oh, all the messy alliances that exactly. led to a disaster. That's my point. Un was. Absolutely unnecessary, irrational, illogical disaster called World War One. And that is my point. That is where my big concern, what I see all this is going. And of course, when you add economic downturn on a global scale, you're going to start to see now countries have to defend their interests at any cost. Because the last thing you want, we'll take the case of China, for example. The last thing China wants is demonstrations in the street from the people who, or, or, whose economic conditions have changed. Right. Because that is the condition they have with the, the uh, ruling government or ruling party. That's the contract they have. In return for that support, in return for that support, is that the uh, China uh, government is going to provide the economic prosperity. And now this ever grand issue, which we will talk about next week in a separate video altogether, because right. we have some of our contacts. We are trying to verify some information before we come on the air, as we always do, because we don't want just, you know, come on. And this is why always uh, one of our viewers last time said, well, this is not a breaking news because it happened yesterday. <laughs> well, there is a reason. As one of our viewers also responded to that by saying, that's called due diligence because we have to verify. And whether whether people know it or not, we're in contact with people internationally that are well-known figures that have deep have done deep dives into these topics and are truly knowledgeable about what's going on. Exactly. So and well, we verify things with them. Exactly, Russ. Well, just to go back to this issue of the container before we open the floor for questions and so forth. So the, the idea of this con shipping containers, on all of a sudden you're seeing this go up. There's also tensions within, for example, and I can't speak for other countries. I speak for ours here in the United States. For example, now that Florida offered that, why aren't we moving towards that and relieving that some of that? Uh, having the, the items in Florida port being, you know, yeah. transported to stores and, and, and so forth. But because of the political climate between the White House and Florida, because Florida is, you know, that kind of doesn't care for pandemic, doesn't care for whatever. They are open. <laughs> and, and their state, they can decide whatever they want. That's right. Because that's choice. what the United States is. United States, you know, the states have a sovereignty. Just FYI for those who do not know. You know, that's how America was set up. The states do have a sovereignty. Yes, there is something called the supremacy clause, where the federal laws supersede those of the state, but within limits. So. So my, my argument has always been, well, if Florida is offering to use this port, why not move the ships from uh, those, those cargo ships that are stuck in L.A. and uh, mm -hmm. Long Beach, move some of them to the East Coast in Florida, and you won't see those kind of problems. You know, to give you perspective on this, there are between 100 and 150 ships right offside uh, Los Angeles and Long Beach. Yeah. Each one of those ships has 24,000 containers on it. Wow. And, you know, the cost of getting it here is about $8,000. Mm -hmm. And so you take a look at 24000 times 100 to 150 just sitting off of Los Angeles. What does that mean in terms of product availability? Especially since some of these are essential items that we don't produce here in the United States anymore. Yeah. We exported the production of those things, and now we can't get them. Exactly. And what does it do also for the cost? Insurance? Doesn't do for gas, doesn't do for salaries for those employees if they are paid over time. Will they ever be paid? Like, you know, there's a lot of lot of lot of moving parts into something like this. But as we said at the beginning, the question for you that you need to think about is the idea of why and who's behind it. That is the that is one of the key. Is it time for us to do questions? Okay. Uh yeah, you want to go here. ahead. You know, the, if you take a if you take a look at this, what you're actually seeing is yeah. that the video game that your child has dreamed of, you might not get it. But more likely, you're going to not be as able to feed your family as well because the cost of things are going up so rapidly that it's going to cause a drop in standard of living for a whole lot of people. Yeah. I, and I think that's the bottom line. Yeah, of this. And when you say that, especially when you say something like this, especially when it comes down to food and all that. Be, uh, I can guarantee you this. What we're going to be noticing is the increase in obesity because people is going to be kids. Cheaper food. Yes, because Lower we all quality. know how. That's another subject for another day. So, uh, all right. Well, we're going to open up the floor for you guys for your questions. 
uh, as we always appreciate oh, it. Oh, it's Boone. Yeah. Here is Boone. Where have you been, Boone? <laughs> Good to see you, brother. Good to see you. So let me put my reading glasses here. And uh, Boone is, is one of, by the way, FYI, just for you guys to know, Boone's been with us since the beginning. Truly, when we just started. So truly appreciate his support, his continued support. So the question is, I came across modern monetary theory, MMT, lightly. It seems like this money printing can go on and on and on. Do you know more about this? Or do we know who can explain this comprehensively? Thanks. Wow. That, that's a little yeah. bit out of my, uh, my area. I just have two sentences to say about it. When I was in college, I took an economics course, which was many, many years ago, mm -hmm. when deficit spending started happening. Mm -hmm. And the pompous guy up front said, we can do this forever. We don't have to balance any budgets. We can just always do this. Then you do a deeper dive a little bit later on, and you find that how what they were counting on was inflation would take care of it once the budget was balanced. Well, we haven't seen a balanced budget in my, and I can remember. So it just keeps getting worse and worse every year, and inflation is not going to take care of yeah. it. So we're going to see inflation, we're going to see higher prices and lower standard of living. That's the bottom exactly. line, and I don't care what those guys said. Exactly. Just to uh, uh, piggyback on what you just said, as far as the balance in the budget, I remember during Bill Clinton uh, first term, the, the, we had a surplus. Yeah, I don't remember that one. So, uh, but the idea, just to go back to Boone's question, is this printing of money. The one thing I know for sure, uh, based on what I read in economics, also because I had classes in at the college regarding economics, is that the more printing we do, the less we're gonna make the uh, the currency uh, strong. The currency right. is gonna be devalued weaker slower. and weaker. Now, here's weaker. the thing: what just been happening? Russia now is moving into that direction of be done with the dollar altogether in all transactions. Second thing, I just found out yesterday, and I am not sure about this, Walmart. Walmart now has kiosk where you can do Bitcoin transactions. It's coming. Together, which means what? That means they are seeing or thinking or whatever that might be about the value of the dollar is going to go down. So that's, uh, uh, hopefully one day we can have someone who can, a guest who can delve deeper into this. All right, let's see next question. Ariel, here he is. Ariel was, was there hey, yesterday. Ariel. So good to see you, Ariel. Uh, question is, do you think the U.S. could have solved it, solved uh, its production cost if they had a successful massive automation of their manufacturer sector replacing Chinese workers? Anyhow, it seems China will do. Wow. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a hardcore economic question, shall we say. So... Uh, the one thing that I know, Ross, is the idea of, uh, if we remember when, when uh, former President uh, Trump came to office and one of the arguments was, we're going to bring manufacturing jobs to the U.S. Those are gone. Those are gone for one reason and one reason only. We are putting profit. When, when I say we, I'm referring to the big corporations. Yeah. They put in profit ahead of the welfare of family, because here is what a big corporation is going to do. They're going to be thinking of fewer employees. Fewer employees means more profit, more profit, less, less cost. cost, less spending on the, uh, you know, that's the bottom line. So if another country somewhere in the world can produce the same product for cheaper, they're going to do that. And do you think that uh, the United States is going to outproduce China in terms of new technology? No. In terms of new automation? We've fallen, we have, you know, we even did, done some shows on this about the United States is falling further and further behind in terms of artificial intelligence and production and a lot of other things. Exactly. And we're going to have one of our guests next week without the closing name, disclosing oh. the name here. Somebody who knows about this field very, very well. So stay tuned in for that. So, so just to go back to your question quickly here, it, it, it's manufacturing jobs are not coming here. So I don't see any changes going on here because especially with the introduction of AI, right. it's going to make things completely different. So U.S. economy, it, it, it's on a different trajectory altogether. Next question. Beryakov. By the way, guys, uh, uh, Ariel Beryakov and Boone were from, with us from Guam is also. They've been with us since the beginning. So we truly appreciate your support, guys. A question. World now today already multipolar. A few days ago, Putin said Russia is not worried at all on China hypersonic missile tests 
as they are allied relations comment <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one you know well this i can speak a little bit about because as i said when i wrote the book about uh, russia called the dynamics of uh, russia's geopolitics i had to tackle the military aspects of it and i i delved deeper into the research about all that was and i did find uh, the trajectory that i saw it going it's going into that direction where china and russia uh, is gonna realize you know we do have differences historically speaking we're gonna put those aside and we're gonna join our forces against the common enemy you know uh, and, and this is where i see it going so yeah russia is not gonna be worried about the hypersonic uh, missile test uh, from china because Ch russia has some advanced stuff also uh, china the, the only thing that's ca catching the world by surprise is, is by the, the speed by which china reached that that's where that challenge but can you imagine russia and china joining the military assets i don't have to imagine it i yeah. can just open my eyes and see it yeah and they are moving into that direction i do predict and i hope i am wrong but i do predict should the conflict erupt in south china sea regarding taiwan and china you're going to see russia getting involved with china and that's going to become a different outcome altogether so let's hope i'm wrong Next question. Uh, oh, Gunther Zelke. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Thank you for being here. Uh, part one is, given the large fertile areas are in eastern U.S. and Canada, eastern China, South, South, uh, South Asia, Europe, East and West Africa, southern Brazil, and northern Argentina, and eastern Australia, Okay. Part two is coming. Uh, part two. Yeah, here is part two. Uh, would there inevitably be higher population and thus higher GDPs over time in those areas since development seems inevitable for all people and thus they went out in those regions? Wow. That is, that is an interesting question. Yeah. I really have to think about that because, uh, you know, they say these are these are arable ter territories. They are good for production of food. Yeah. And in the United States, what we see is two percent of the population is involved in food production, and they feed ninety-eight percent of the people. Yeah. Right now, about thirty-six percent of the population in China uh -huh. is devoted to food production uh -huh. on its way down, thanks to the automation and thanks to uh, growing technologies in agriculture. So. I'm not seeing population growth in those areas. Yeah. I'm, but they might be highly productive yeah. in terms of food. Yeah. The way I see the concern in all this is, for example, with what uh, Bill Gates, for example, doing buying, purchasing farmlands across the country. Why? You know, uh, and I, I've been following what's going on with Bill Gates as far as what's doing regarding population <laughs> reduction, shall we say? Uh, and I'll let you read between the line yourself. Look no further than the project he was doing in India and what happened there, or Africa for that matter. So now the argument from uh, uh, Mr. Gates is that, well, we need to sort of figure out a way uh, in, in a nicer way setting a reduced population, shall we say. So, <laughs> so buying farmlands and all that. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those hard things to, to really project this. And I don't claim to have an answer to the reason being because like what uh, Hussein said yesterday during our interview. Yeah. We're getting the BRI. So, and how much it can expand on that global growth, but you got the, half of the world undermining that. So, uh, yeah, we, we're going to see some, uh, the way I look at it, some imbalance between certain regions. You look at Latin America. Yeah. Why there is poverty in Latin America in comparison to some other parts in Asia? Why in Africa, with all the resources, there's no development there? You know, is somebody by design preventing those areas from emerging? Good question. Here's a data point for you. Yeah. What is the number one thing that humanity can do to reduce population? Make everyone middle class. Yeah. Middle class has one or two children, and the lower classes have many more children. And so bringing people to the middle class population starts coming under control as we're seeing in middle class all over europe it's even even and we, i don't know china's a whole different story yeah but europe the united states and other places that have a large middle class 
that middle class population has fewer and fewer children. Wow, that that is an interesting observation. So it's it's very very hard to. This is a very deep question as to it requires more time to tackle with. But what I see personally is that uh, different parts, different regions of the world, it depending again on how much economic activity is going on there, whether the government is for or against the growth of population in that part. So, uh, next question. Uh, ten de ten de one chin. I hope I pronounce it correctly. good enough. Yeah, thank you for being here, and and pardon me if I mispronounced the name here. The question is: Is there any chance both Democrats and Republicans will eventually accept the balance of power of U.S. with China Russia? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. Oh, see, that's why you, you got to ask us more questions like this. Well, yeah. This is a great, great question. See, that's what I told Hussein yesterday when he, he liked the question from one, one of our... I said, Hussein, this is a sample of... That's how our viewers are. And this is why we have a great respect for you guys. All of you, no exception. Uh, yes, you get some elements here and there, but that's, you know, no worries. Well, this is... A, the reason this is so interesting is one of the one of the ways that, these, that our current government is staying in power is to have an enemy. And even though they can't, they can't agree on so many other things, they agree that there is a particular country that they need to defend against. Yeah. And this is where, uh, just for just to elaborate a little bit more about Republicans and Democrats, there are two faces of the same coin. Right. Most Americans have no clue, have no idea that both parties have been controlling the political process in the United States for the last 150 years. And this is why uh, uh, one time I remember we did a video and I gave an analogy of how we, we citizens are like football. And on each side of the field, one quarterback Republican, another quarterback is Democrats, and they threw in the ball to each other <laughs> every four years or every eight years. You know, it's the same policy, it's the same strategy, it's the same whatever. So the question is going to become for, will the American people wake up? That is the key question. Because they are so distracted by so many things that the government wants that. Because the less you ask, the better it is for the government. Because the moment you start asking questions, you become a threat to the government. So the idea of the government, uh, you know, Republicans, Democrats, Congress, whatever you want to call it, they have to either create an, a perceived or a real enemy to justify the engagements in conflict. So what makes, it's like what we said earlier. How come the White House just this morning changed, flipped on its policy regarding Taiwan? That's been signed since 1979 or 78. All we stand in, or st we stand on regarding this policy is China, two policies, two systems, one country, and we will not defend Taiwan. We will provide weapons, and that's it. All of a sudden, this morning, you're changing this because this is the direction where the country is going. But till Americans wake up, nothing's going to change, and we are hoping with this program to raise that awareness in people to start understand. There is much more in it than just what the government is saying. Oh, and this is for the betterment of all of us, not just Americans here. All of us. All humans. people. Yeah, all of us. We'd rather be in a peaceful world than one that has been triggered by conflict right and left. Because someday, someone by mistake is going to pull the trigger mistakenly and it will be too late to control. So that's what I see it. Next question. Oh, thank you, Journey to the East. Appreciate your stickers. We truly appreciate it. Uh, U.S. and U.K. have shown interest in joining the China International Space Station. Question. Will China allow U.S. and U.K. to use their space station? I got a <laughs> solid answer to you is no. No. <laughs> no. No, it would be a mistake of if China ever did. And they're not going to do that. that China is not going to allow it. I mean, we kicked China out of the ISS by passing legislation in Congress that bans the Chinese astronauts from. So and what, in, yeah, what incentive does China has to do? Zero. Like zero, yeah. Zero. I don't see them. There. And we see China taking a very hard stance against the belligerency of the United yeah, States. Yeah. And what you're going to see regarding the space uh, which, by the way, China just launched about five days ago, six days ago, three astronauts that are going to go one up for six months to do some experiments. Well, it's part of the space station. 
the building it quick it's going to be ready uh, to go uh, china is going to be well served by maintaining that on its own now i am sure they're going to cooperate with russia oh, for sure. <laughs> i am sure they're going to cooperate with some other countries india maybe maybe not uh, 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 the european space agency uh, i uh, i don't know uh, china is going to be very very what's the word i'm looking for careful about who it's going to live there because they do have, and I'll say it because I am not going to sugarcoat it, they do have some far bigger ambitions regarding space. And that's what we said last time regarding the military dimension to it. You know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they end up being the first to bring back helium three. Yeah, I won't be surprised. So, so no, the, the, the quick answer to that is no. <laughs> and definitive as well. <laughs> definitive, right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, next question, Lee Wong. Good to see you. Oh, I like the the image. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I like it. Good to see you. Question is, did China divert its manufactured product to different markets, which caused a shortage in the U.S.? That doesn't seem to be the problem. Uh, the issue is with transportation, the ports, and in transportation to distribute the goods. Yeah. Not to my knowledge. I I didn't come across yet. And, and uh, uh, believe it or not, one of the information we are waiting to confirm has to do with this. And that's why we're going to shoot the video next week, uh, because by, uh, I think by Monday, we're going to have that information complete as far as verified and all that. And we're going to do that. But I do not see this uh, reason for why there is the shortage. The shortage is tied to some other dimensions uh, because the chain, the supply chain is very, very, very complicated. And you think about it, if you are producing a product, uh, one product, let's say you're producing product A that is a very sophisticated and it has 100 pieces to it and you are missing one piece, you that, don't have product, a product. that product cannot come out to the market. So that's that. Next question. Oh, here's Michael. Good to see you, Michael. Uh, Michael is also always, always commenting on our stuff. So good to see you, Michael. The question is the US and NATO appear to be destroying all the benchmarks to prevent a war. Are they doing this on purpose? One thing we yeah. know is they're justifying their existence. Yeah, but do you know what he meant by this question? No, I don't. Yeah, what he meant is NATO is doing things intentionally to destroy the war barriers so they can justify an action. And what I'm referring to here uh, is a, as a is a white paper that I just read two days ago. And it has to do with, it was an internal inside NATO. It says that China is a threat to Western Europe. And when you look at the map, if the map. <laughs> I noticed they're getting closer and closer exactly. every year. Yeah. So the space in between yeah. is close. But here is the thing, Ross. is this? Yeah, that statement is exactly what this question is referring to. Okay. So you are absolutely correct as far as what NATO is doing. But also, as Ross mentioned, is the question of what is the mission of NATO? We can't figure out why. Yeah, why it has no purpose whatsoever. So they're going to have to find, create, perceived or real enemies that just so they can justify their presence. Even former President Trump said, what are we here for? What's NATO exist for? Yeah. So you're going to be hearing a lot of rhetoric like this. But at the same time, when you're seeing Russia and China join in, Militarily, that's your indication for, oh, we are now moving into a multipolar system. Gone those days. So, so the numbers of NATO, uh, the days for NATO, it's our number. I just don't see them staying for another seven years. There's no way. There's no way. Yeah. Athen Wu, good to see you, Athen. Uh, question regarding China hypersonic missile tests. China insisted that we're only spacecraft tests. U.S. just wants to use this to get more money for MIC. Which side of the story should we believe? Yeah. Wow, that is, that is a good one. We did use, and, and we'll admit it, we did use the term missile hypersonic. You know, And the reason we use that, because that's based on our own information that we gathered, through some other entities, mm -hmm. through third, second entity, and so forth, that it was indeed a missile. The other one suggesting that it was a space, uh, what do we call it? Not spacecraft, but uh, some sort of module. Some aerial. Spaceship. 
something, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so there are two sides to the story. But so far for us, we are we believe that it was a missile hypersonic because those are the ones that has been tested uh, by even North Korea recently. Oh, yeah. Very recently. Yeah. yeah. So uh, because there are three countries that have that capability, Russia, the United States and China. So that's where we see. But at the same time, the U.S. is going to justify that now for more money. Of course, uh, let alone the budget of the U.S. defense for 2022 has added a $50 billion. And this now is going to become another push. Oh, my gosh, we need to develop even advanced hypersonic stuff and all that, which requires a lot of money. And But at the same by time... By the way, let's ignore AI, artificial intelligence. Exactly. And uh, build more expensive tanks. Yeah. Cut me a break. Yeah, and how about infrastructure? Oh, uh, yeah. oh forget about yeah, that. Yeah, how, how about uh, education in America? How about the how, homeless? How about healthcare? How about so many things that are truly important to the American people, whereas another tank or this... These just are not important yeah. when you're trying to put food on the table and the prices are skyrocketing. But also, this is also the perfect environment when you have a, a society that is so sleepy. It has no clue because they are worrying about watching the idiot box, whatever the media says, and they end up just like, oh, this saying this, oh, this saying that, rather than thinking for where things are moving. Because we don't have, some of us, I shall not generalize, we do not have critical thinking to see what the government is doing versus what needs to be done. Because we don't understand the core concept of what was said in the constitution that the government is for the people, by the people. You know, sometime soon we're gonna do a deep dive into how the American education system creates sheep as opposed to critical thinkers. Yeah. Elizabeth and I are gonna do that sometime soon. That's great that, you know, I'd be happy to answer whatever questions you got. As a, as a faculty myself, one who teaches at university, I can see and I challenge my students on that. That's why they like my classes because I don't, I, we don't talk about what's in the book. You don't need me for that. You can read your own. I got to challenge your intellectual capabilities to see what are you made of. Right. And they appreciate that because now they're saying, you know, this is what education is all about, but not what the American institutions are doing. So that's another story. Which, by the way, you and Elizabeth can have. I'm sure you guys, a lot of people would be willing to listen to something like this. So, next question. Yeah, that's the last question, by the way, guys, because we have to go prepare some stuff for next week. Uh, in Nu'man, uh, this gentleman was there yesterday. He, he put another question. Good to see you, Nu'man. Uh, uh, question OPEC will increase production by 400,000 barrels a day till December. But global demand is so high. Where are the green energy? <laughs> Good one, man. Good one. Yeah. Uh, just to go back to this, because I know a little bit about, uh, is that uh, the, the confirmation for the 400,000 uh, barrel a day has not been confirmed. Because the White House did ask for the increased production, but also reduction in prices, and they got no answer. And usually if they are to increase this, if you want to bring the barrel of oil down because here is the thing just for all of us to know if a barrel of oil reaches hundred dollars that's very problematic so what incentive opec has to lower the prices instead of making more money they're like who cares with what american asked for so right so i i have not seen that yet i am gonna check on it to make sure because i like to know that i've been following opec from a distance for years I even remember when Ahmed Zaki Yamani used to be the head of the, the Saudi uh, uh, oil minister because Saudi Arabia was controlling the prices. Saudi is the uh, linchpin of the OPEC. So uh, I did not see that. But so far, they have not responded positively to the request from the White House three times. So to me, that's an indication right there. It tells you what it is. Are you sure it's not they're shouting at us? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. So, so. Well, we want to thank you so much for being here. We truly, truly enjoy this. I, I do. I don't I, enjoy this. This is really fun. I enjoy this Fridays. And uh, and uh, follow us on say? Instagram. No, I was going to say something else. Oh, yeah. well, we'd like to thank you for watching. We can't encourage you enough to subscribe to what's going on. And no, exactly. No, that's not what I was going to say. What were you going to say? Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> So I was going to say that we truly enjoy those Friday conversations <laughs> because 
It's this kind of interactions that help us both learn. I learned from those questions, Ross. You know, one of the things that we say very frequently is we respect that you have a different perspective. You've got different information. You might live in a different part of the world. And as we said at the onset of this show, we want to give you the best information we have on our best thinking and invite you to think for yourself. Come to your own conclusions. Exactly. And share good information with us, which you're doing very nicely. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, please, guys, help us reach that 70 million <laughs> subscribers. So. But don't forget to follow us on Instagram. Don't forget to follow us on TikTok. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. And as always, we thank all of you. But also remember our membership uh, at uh, geopoliticsinconflict.com. Uh, because. And we have two presentations for free, right? Is that correct? No, no. no? Um, that are coming up that you guys are going to get. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're going to do two presentations coming up soon. Uh, Elizabeth will let, let us know. She is the boss. <laughs> this, so she'll let us know when we get. But we're going to do that soon. I think even by the, before the end of the month or maybe the oh, next yeah, week. Oh, yeah. She's going to let us know. Whenever she says, give us the green light, we're going to do that. So we hope you can join our membership there. And... Uh, and also, yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. And also remember, we are on a rainbow and Odyssey, and you know why we are there. Because you know why. We don't need to say it. So, And as always, we want to say stay informed, and thank you for being here. Until next time.